Hello and welcome back to Measure Theory. As always, I want to thank all the nice supporters on Steady. Today we continue with the outer measures, namely part 2, where I want to show you some examples. Maybe it's a good idea for the start to restate the properties of an outer measure. We always called the map phi and it was defined on the power set of a given set x. And the values were the non-negative numbers where we include the symbol infinity as always. Such a map phi is then called an outer measure if it satisfies these three properties, namely it sends the empty set to zero, it is monotonic and sigma sub-additive. We discussed that last time so that we can immediately start with the examples. I want to show you here three examples where the last one is the important one. But let's start with two simple ones first. A good starting point would be to choose the real numbers as our set x. And then let's define an outer measure where we see the first property immediately, which means we define it as zero if the set A is the empty set. And in the case that A is not the empty set, we set it as one. This simple definition gives us immediately an outer measure. You can see immediately that the three properties are fulfilled. Yeah, the first one we already talked about. Monotonic is not a problem because you always get out one. So if you have subsets, you also get out one on both sides. So the inequality is fulfilled. And the same for the sigma subadditivity. If you look at the left hand side, you would have the one. And on the right hand side, the ones would add up. So also the inequality is fulfilled. You see, this one is a simple example, but a good one, because we immediately get out an outer measure, which is not an ordinary measure. This one you also see immediately, we don't have the sigma additivity, so without the sub. With the same reasoning as before, on the right hand side you add up once, and on the left hand side you don't add them up. And without the sigma additivity, we don't have a measure. Now the next example is also not a hard one. Now let's choose instead of R the natural numbers for the set X. The definition is now the following. In the case that A is a finite set, I want to count the elements and I denote that with the bars. This is what we call the cardinality of the set. And now in the case that the set A is not finite, we use of course our nice symbol infinity. And this gives us again an outer measure. That is not hard to check because we just count elements so all the things here are immediately fulfilled. Indeed we also recognize that this map is sigma additive so actually it's an ordinary measure. This is important because the map is the famous counting measure. The name tells you what to do, you count elements. And in fact, this one is very important because the integration with respect to this measure gives you normal sums and series. Okay, we don't want to talk about ordinary measures here, so let's go to our important example 3. Maybe you already guessed it, it should have something to do with the Lebesgue measure. The best starting point for that is the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure, so the measure that we use to measure normal lengths. You already know, for intervals we can write down the length immediately, therefore we consider here the set of all these bounded intervals. I want to use a good name for this set, therefore I choose this curved i here. For the length of such an interval we just use a function we call mu, so mu of such an interval is given by b minus a. Of course, this one is what you call the normal length of an interval. Now when you look back at Kara Theodore's extension theorem, you see that this one is what we called a semi-ring of sets and the function mu was a pre-measure. In addition, you also remember that we want to measure more sets than just intervals and if we want to measure all sets, this leads us to the power set and therefore to the outer measure. Hence we define our phi on the power set of R. However, this one is a little bit more complicated 
than before. If we now want to define a one-dimensional length for an arbitrary subset of R, which we call A, we can use our intervals. More concretely, for our set A, we can choose intervals, let's call them ij, and now we can cover the whole set by looking at the union of all these intervals. And so we cover the set with the intervals, so we have here a subset relation. So maybe a little picture for this. So imagine the screen set is A, so a subset of the real line, and now we can choose some intervals. So here this would be A1, and here you can choose A2, and so on until we reach here I6. So you see in this example we covered the whole set A with just six intervals. Therefore we would fill in I7, I8 and so on with the empty set. So we just choose the empty interval out of this set. And then we can still write it as this countable union of the intervals. However, you can imagine in the case that A stretches to infinity, we really need infinitely many intervals to cover A. Still, the important part is that we just choose countable many intervals. Now, in order to get a length for A, we just could add up all the lengths of these intervals. Please note, we are allowed to put ij into the function u, but in general, we can't do that for A. Therefore, this one is a good substitution for the length of A, just because in the picture we see it gives us an upper bound for something we would call the real length of A. Of course, one idea would be to look at all the intervals that cover A and then to calculate this length. In other words, we look at a set of all possible values. Hence the condition here is that we choose intervals ij, where j goes from 1 to infinity, out of our curved i. And of course the property that these intervals cover whole a. Now we have this whole set of numbers and we already know this number gets smaller and smaller if we choose the intervals better and better fitting to our set a. And in this limit process we reach a number that we would call the length of A. And of course, we reach that number by choosing the infimum here. And that's now the whole definition of phi of A. And now you see where the name outer measure comes from, because in the picture and in the definition, this is clearly an approximation from the outside. We choose bigger sets that we can measure from the outside and shrink them together such that we get out a number for A. Our result here is now also this phi is an outer measure. This one we can't see immediately, therefore I use the rest of this video to show you exactly this. We do this in all detail because as you can see this goes all in the direction of Kava Theodore's extension theorem. So let's start here by checking all the three properties of an outer measure. And we called them a, b, c, so let's start with a. This one said that the empty set gets mapped to zero. Here we don't have to write down anything because you see it immediately. You could choose empty intervals as our covering. Or you choose one interval and we shrink that to one point and you get out the length zero. Much more interesting is here the second property, the monotonicity. Here we choose two sets where the one is a subset of the other one. Here I have written down the definition of phi b. It's again the infimum of these lengths where we choose intervals that cover now the set b. However, we know that b is bigger than a, a superset of a, which means these intervals also cover the set a. This means that if we look at all possible intervals that cover A, then we know we have more intervals here than here. And because we only add new intervals here, we know that the infimum can't get bigger. It only gets smaller or stays the same. And with this we have everything we want, because here we have the definition of phi A. And then we see the monotonicity 
phi b is indeed greater or equal than phi a. Okay, that was part b. Now let's go to the sigma subadditivity. Now we call the thing we want to show is phi of the union of some subsets a n is less or equal than if we look at the series or sum of phi a n. We immediately see two different cases here. The first case would be that at least one of these phi a n's is infinity, which means we have an infinite length of one of these sets. However, this simply means that on the right hand side, we always have infinity and then the inequality is always fulfilled. We don't have to show anything then. Therefore, the only case where we really have to work is the case when all of these phi a n's are finite. The only problem I see for our proof here is the infimum in the definition of phi b. But we can get rid of this if we use an arbitrarily small number epsilon. And to get rid of all the infima here, we have to choose an epsilon n for all the different a n's here. And I want to choose them so small that the sum over all the epsilon n gives us our epsilon back. Of course, this is reasonable and also always possible, but why it's important, you will see later in the proof. Then let's look at the length of one a n. We know we can approximate it with the length of intervals, which means we can choose some intervals here, but of course we have now different a n's, so we need a second index. So I would call it i, j, comma, n in the index. Approximation from the outside now means this one is the sum of the lengths of these intervals. So please note here, the n is fixed. Now I hope that you have seen that this can't be completely correct. We don't have an equality sign here. Simply because by definition, the length of a n is given by the infimum. So the left hand side would be in general smaller than the right hand side. However, what we know is that we can get as close as we want, which means now comes our epsilon in. So minus epsilon n brings us to something smaller on the right hand side. So we have this inequality. This is simply given by the property of the infimum being the largest lower bound. Well, and of course we want the other thing from the intervals that we cover the whole set a n. Now we have everything we need from the definition of phi a n such that we can now look at the union on the left hand side. For the union of the a n's we also have a covering because we have it for each a n. On the right hand side here you can just see a countable union of intervals. It's no problem that we have two indices here. For example in a short way you could write it like this. So please don't forget what we want to show. We want to show the inequality here. So we have to look at phi of this union. Of course, we can use what we have already shown, namely the monotonicity. Here you see we have a superset of the union. Therefore, the monotonicity tells us we can use the inequality and write on the right hand side phi of this set. And there we now have the outer measure of a union of intervals. In other words, we approximate from the outside intervals with intervals. Hence, we already know that we get out here the sum of the lengths of these intervals. However, we don't know if this is indeed the infimum because there could be better intervals. If there is some overlap, you can imagine, then you could choose other intervals that approximate the length better. But this is not a problem because you know we have at least the inequality. Now on the right hand side, we have the sum with two indices and I would say we separate them again. So on the outside, the sum over n and in the inside, the one over j. We do this because for the inner sum, we already have an estimate from the beginning. That is how we have chosen the intervals. Actually, this is the whole reason why we have introduced the epsilon n's because we have this calculation here. Now with our red inequality here, we get for the inner sum phi of a n plus epsilon n. Now we are almost finished because what we have on the right hand side here is the sum 
over the phi of a n plus the sum over the epsilon n and we know we have chosen the epsilon n in such a way that they sum up to epsilon. So we have here just the remaining epsilon. Now if you read this you see our inequality we wanted to show holds with the exception of one small error epsilon. However this epsilon was chosen arbitrarily from the beginning. This means that we can choose the error as small as we want and then no other possibility remains than that the inequality holds without an error. And with this the proof is finished. We have shown that phi is indeed an outer measure. In addition I can tell you that in the case that you don't want to calculate just lengths but rather areas or in general n-dimensional volumes, you can use a similar definition for phi and also a similar proof in this way. And here you can see we are on the way for the construction of the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure. Okay, that's good enough for today. We will continue our journey in the next video. So thank you for listening and see you next time. Bye.